everybody um, to uh, tonight's presentation. Uh, my name is Jim Hopper. I am the executive director of the Bainbridge Community Foundation. Um, and we like to begin our uh, events with a land acknowledgement. So this is true of Paul and I who are located here on Bainbridge Island. Um, we are on the ancestral land of the Suquamish people. As Chief Seattle said, every part of the soil is sacred in the estimation of my people. Every hillside, every valley, every plain and every grove has been hallowed by some sad or happy event in days long vanished. So recognizing that we are on Suquamish, the Aboriginal land of the Suquamish people, the people of the clear salt water, expert fishermen, canoe builders, and basket weavers, the Suquamish live in with harmony in the lands, uh, with the lands and waterways along Washington Central Salish Sea, as they have for thousands of years. Here the Suquamish live and protect the land and waters of their ancestors for future generations, as promised by the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855. Um, my name is Jim Hopper, as I said, the director of Bainbridge Community Foundation. Um, this marks uh, uh, one of our most favorite times of the year when we get to um, share some financial education um, um, openly and, and easily and accessibly. And we have a wonderful guy by the name of Paul Merriman to, to thank for that. Um, just want to note, too, if you go to our website and you click on the events tab over on the left hand side, you'll be able to um, scroll down and see what we've got coming up. We've got two more of these presentations. Christine Benz is speaking next week um, about investing in retirement. And then Mary Beth Franklin will be speaking the following week um, about uh, Social Security. So um, with that, uh, just a couple of notes. Today's presentation is closed caption. You'll see a little CC button in the Zoom menu down at the, at the for most of you at the bottom of your screen. Um, feel free to click that for closed captioning. Um, we also have a uh, Q&A feature. So if you click on the Q&A button, that's where you can ask questions of either Tom or Paul or, or both of us. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce um, the distinguished Paul Merriman. Of course, Paul is a nationally uh, recognized authority on mutual funds, index investing, and asset allocation. Many of you are familiar with his books, his podcasts, or his um, regular column in Wall Street Journal's Market Watch. Um, in retirement, Paul's really dedicated his life to ensuring that people have access to financial tools. Um, people have access that in the past was typically reserved only for those with great wealth. So he's really um, taken this on as his personal passion. We've been doing these um, financial education series with him uh, since 2016, and um, we're just delighted to have him. So I'm going to welcome Paul, who's going to introduce Tom, our speaker for today. Uh, that's great, Jim. Thank you so much. Uh, it really has been a joy, and I look forward to many more years of these uh, uh, financial literacy. By the way, I should mention, uh, we had uh, Tim Ranzetta last year, year before. Uh, he runs an organization called Next Generation Personal Finance. Uh, they have a mission of having every high school in America by 2030 have a required course uh, on personal finance, and and uh, and and he he has gone a long way in, in 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 getting there. Many states now do require it. He's not responsible for every one of them, but I will tell you what he just got. He just got a commitment from Michael Jordan uh, for a hundred million dollars, ten million dollars a year. Uh, to uh, uh, to underwrite the work that that he is doing. So uh, this is a I think a, a huge step in getting the youth of America uh, educated, uh, having to do with personal finance. So uh, I, I really congratulate uh, Tim Ranzetta for his uh, his accomplishments. But today uh, I am here to introduce uh, a a truly dear friend and somebody that I respect and I enjoy uh, and and we've been friends for about 30 years. Uh, in fact, one time at one point we worked together uh, doing uh, a, a podcast and radio show. Uh, I went to a dinner last night to celebrate the 40 year anniversary of my old investment management firm, Merriman Wealth Management, I was asked to speak and I was asked to talk about some of the things that made a difference in the early years of our company. And I talked about my son, 
who was there by my side for most all of those years. I talked about Rich Buck, who was, used to be the financial writer at the Seattle Times uh, and joined our firm. And, and, and not only did he work with the firm for many years, but he retired about the same time as I did. And Rich and I still work trying to communicate uh, with people about investing. And I mentioned uh, a name that, uh, uh, that, that uh, you might not know, but his name is Dennis Tilly. And he was the guy that came aboard and brought us uh, some of the most uh, interesting and I, I think uh, profitable uh, research on, uh, on investments and how to build portfolios. But the fourth member of that team of, of the powerhouses who made a big difference in, uh, in, in, our, in our company and its growth was Tom Cock. He came in, he showed me how to work with, I mean, he, he was the expert. He came from the radio industry. Uh, he had TV experience. And so he helped us uh, build uh, a radio show that, that aired in Seattle for I think a decade. Uh, he, he brought us into the uh, podcast community. Uh, and then after he, he, uh, he made us a, a much better firm in terms of communicating with people, he left. And he left to start his own firm and has since built a, a remarkable firm here in the Northwest, was known as Vestry. Uh, now he is a part of Appella uh, Capital, a, 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 a national firm with branches around the country. And Tom, I, I think, as I understand it, you are the managing the director for basically the West Coast offices. So, so um, I, you can tell you can tell the rest of that story. But I'll tell you, here's a guy that has devoted his career to teaching others, not only at the Merriman Company, but in his own company. He has a radio show along with Don McDonald uh, talking real money. And, um, and they have a daily podcast, uh, Talking Real Money. And uh, he has all of that, that, uh, that commitment to helping the individual investor that I've always wanted to have myself. So I couldn't be happier than to introduce you to Tom Cock. And he is going to talk about what do you do when you're 40 to 65 years old and you're getting pointed towards retirement and the steps and the pitfalls. And Tom, it's all yours. Thanks for coming and joining us here at this, uh, this annual affair. Well, thank you for that uh, terrific introduction. Although I didn't, I never see myself as Ringo. So I'd rather be like George or one of John maybe, but I'll, I guess I'll go with it, but thank you for that. And, and uh, I will say this about uh, my lengthy friendship with you, Paul, and uh, all, all, much, all that I've learned from Paul and all that I've stolen from Paul. In fact, it was about 10 years that my son heard Paul speak and he came back and he said, did you take everything from Paul? I mean, didn't any of the stuff yours? So I've, I, it, it's been a great friendship and, uh, and I'm blessed truly to have you in my life in, in so many ways. So thank you for that. And before I begin, and I'm going to spend, uh, I'm going to see if I can share my screen here. I'm going to spend... Um, much of the time, not necessarily on investing per se, but on kind of a little bit about planning, because we all want to jump into making money before we really think about what we're trying to do. And before I do that, I want to tell you, <laughs> this is a fascinating, investing is a fascinating thing. There are so many ways to invest your money, so many ideas, so many people telling you what to do, so many voices that are coming at you on a regular basis. And the reality is for most of us, it's a process of elimination. There's many things you should never invest in. And I'm, I, I, when I was thinking about today, I just put together this brief list and I'm always amazed how big the list is. Um, for example, non-traded real estate investment trusts, variable annuities, equity index annuities. These are all things I would not suggest you put your money in. Hedge funds options and futures, derivatives, viatical settlements. You don't hear as much about them today, but they certainly are still out there and people are still pitching them. Master limited partnerships, which made the, uh, some people money, but not necessarily the people that own them. Um, 
more recently, things like cryptocurrency, uh, special, uh, I always forget, SPACs uh, have been popular, initial public offerings, actively managed mutual funds. Paul and I share a belief in using index or index-like mutual funds. Gold and precious metals. I don't think you should put your money in commodities, currencies, art, and collectibles. And I hope I don't have to say this, uh, but I don't think you should invest in lottery tickets and hope that that is somehow an investment. Um, so those are things I would sort of rule out without even uh, without a second thought, frankly. And because I've seen people make so many mistakes uh, in putting their money in things like that and, and not having uh, eliminated them before they even get started. I will say at the outset, and before I even show you any of this, that there are things I truly do believe in. One of them is being globally diversified, holding stocks all over the world. And I'm going to show you, share with you uh, what I believe about and how to do that. Another one is paying attention to your costs. Uh, most of Wall Street really has no interest in saving you money. They're really interested in taking your money. And the people that have been smart investors, the information that Paul has shared with people for 40 years, um, helps you understand how you can do this at a much lower cost. I do believe in rules-based or index style investing. And uh, I do believe in some factors of investing, which I'll talk about here in a couple of minutes. So, but before I get into what you should do with your money, as I say, most people who call our show, and Paul kindly mentioned that we have a program called Talking Real Money. It airs here in the Northwest on what is now Northwest News Radio, Saturdays at noon uh, for two hours. It's live calling, and we take every call. We don't we don't screen anything. We take everybody, a few people from time to time call in and argue with us. But the number one question we get, it's a fascinating thing. The number one question is, I just came into this money. What do I do with it now? And this is human nature. We just tend to put all this stuff off until something arises. Either I'm close to retirement, I received an inheritance, I'm starting a job. One of my favorite all-time calls was a, a young man who had recently become a physician. He said he had half a million dollars in uh, student loan debt, and he also borrowed another half a million to join a practice. And he said, what should I do now? And I and unkindly said, get to work, uh, because I couldn't think of anything else catchier to say. But most of the the, the questions always seem to revolve around investing what do I do with the money? They skip this first part around planning, because unless you know what you're saving the money for, unless you have a plan about your finances, you really shouldn't be investing. You shouldn't just take this money out and say, well, I hear the hot thing today is fill in the blank. Um, you should have, in my mind, especially in this period, 40 to 65, a, at least a five-year plan. And I'll tell you about mine. I just turned 65. And my five-year plan is to uh, not touch any of the money I've saved until age 70. I, I want to keep it growing. I want to make it. I, I also figure that uh, if I don't touch any of it till 70, there's a very good chance that I will not run out, even if I'm lucky enough to get uh, 90 years. And that's kind of my personal goal. Um, so, but that's my plan. But everybody should have a five-year plan. I'm saving for a house. I want to have this much in my retirement account. I want to start a, a saving plan for my child. Some sort of plan before we just start rushing out and, and doing uh, putting money aside, which brings me to saving. There is no correct number in terms of saving. There is no you know magic bullet, if you will. There is, frankly, you read all the time about if you're 30, you should have this much saved. If you're 40, 50. You know, the rules of thumb are rules of thumb. They're really not worthwhile. Uh, but if you had to push me, if you had to say, what I got to do something, what should I do? I would save anybody in this, especially in this 40 to 65 uh, period of time, should be saving, you know, probably 15% of your income at the very least. Uh, and, and you should be doing this in either a pre-tax, like traditional IRA, and I'm going to spend more time on all these things, a post-tax Roth. IRA or 401k, which remembering that money goes into an account after you've already paid tax on it, or a brokerage account. And this is something we're going to be talking on our podcast next week. It's fascinating to me that you could actually set up a brokerage account, live off the investment income from that and pay zero in taxes. And this is why more and more times I think you shouldn't just be putting it all in a traditional uh, 401k or IRA or Roth, but brokerage should be carefully considered as well. And then the investing part of all this, uh, 
I mentioned the things I would not like you to invest in. I wouldn't touch. Our clients certainly don't. Uh, we manage money here in the Northwest for about 800 individuals. I think it's a little over $700 million in sort of across the country, it's a little more than $3 billion. And we would never touch an actively managed product. What am I talking about? I'm talking about a mutual fund or exchange traded fund that has someone there picking stocks or timing markets or telling you this sector is going to be better than the rest. And none of those people know any more than you do. You're not going to believe me when I say that, but that's the reality because the future is uncertain. And we're going to share with you some numbers and, and thank you, Paul, and the Merriman Foundation for providing these on a regular basis that looks at sort of how groups of stocks have performed over the last 53 years. I think you can somewhat reliably look at that and say, maybe the future looks this way. But the reality is we know nothing about the future starting tomorrow. In fact, I didn't even see what the market did today. So it was a very busy day. But investing should be in a, using index or rules-based products, if you will, low cost, tax efficient, and any index product in and of itself should be relatively uh, tax efficient. And then properly balanced, this is for each individual, and I'll spend a little more time on this, between stocks and bonds and a diversified portfolio. But if you're between 40 and 60, what are generally some of the things you're saving for? Well, we're going to talk about emergencies, we'll talk about retirement, we'll talk about paying for college, and then we'll talk about this other thing that I I see a lot, but I, I question whether you really need to do, and that is other real estate. Um, you know, I've never been one to own a second home, but I know many of you do, many of you want to, maybe you want to get a place in the Southwest and get out of this, this weather for a time. Um, but we'll talk about sort of how you should be saving, how you can save for that and the best ways to do so. Um, but first to the emergencies part, this is one of the mistakes I see most people make. They either have way too much saved in banks or are sort of cash-like instruments or way too much in stocks, and they don't realize which one they have. In fact, one of the things we've done with our firm uh, since uh, since I left Paul a long time ago, we for absolutely nothing, we will sit down and look at your portfolio and tell you uh, how diversified you are, how much you're spending on that portfolio, how much risk you're taking. Every person should know that about all of their money. I had a client come in today, wonderful client, and hadn't seen her in a couple of years because she's been very busy and didn't want to come in because of COVID. And her cash is piled up to about $200,000. And it's at the Bank of America, which is paying her 0.02. This is so inefficient, right? In a day where, and I just looked this up, if, if you're saving for emergencies or some other short-term uh, so, uh, goal, Right now, if and you can learn these, I got bankrate.com up here. You can go to bankrate and simply click on high yield savings. It's CIT Bank, uh, and maybe they're trying to be, pretend to be Citibank. I don't know. CIT Bank, you can now make 4.75% in a high yield savings account, 4.75. And that is every bit as safe. It is FDIC insured. It's every bit as safe as any of the major banks, even though people have got this weird thing now. Like I want to have all my bank, my money in Bank of America. Every bit is safe, at least especially up to the 250000 Or you could get a 10-month CD, a 10-month CD at Marcos Bank for 5% now, 10 months at 5%. So the idea that you have the cash is trash is kind of gone now. And you can, in fact, a lot of suggestion about whether or not you should be balancing your portfolio between things like this and stocks rather than using bonds. And we can talk about that in a couple of minutes. But for emergencies... I personally think between six and 10 months of, of what you need to spend is a great plenty. Um, if, and if you're, if you're worried about your job, then maybe you have a little bit more or you have a goal within five years. I, I would have it in this sort of instrument. I don't believe in owning stocks if I'm going to need the money prior to uh, five years, for example, because there are periods of time where stocks are down for that period of time. I hope I hope we're not in one of them right now, but you never know. So you got to be ready and you got to be prepared for all those things. So that's my take on kind of emergencies. And this should be high on the list, especially if you're between 40 and 65, especially if you have a family, you have others who are relying on you. You don't want to be in a position where if something bad were to happen, you have to uh, take money out of your retirement savings, for example. That would be a bad thing to do. And I do want to remind you again, I think uh, I think uh, Jim mentioned this that you can you can at any time you can ask questions. Paul's 
going to be keeping track of all those, and we're happy to answer them as we get time. And we'll certainly answer them all at the end. So emergencies would be part one. Part two would then be saving for retirement. And this comes before uh, saving for college. This comes before buying a vacation home or a boat or some other thing. Retirement between 40 and 65, you are truly in the red zone and you should be saving. I'd like to see it be more than the 15%. In fact, for old people like me over the age of 50, you can save $30,000 this year. $30,000 you can set aside and you could split that between pre-tax and post-tax. And for those of you who oftentimes call our show and say, this is really unfair because I'm self-employed and I can't save, it's harder. You know, I just looked this up. It's a fascinating thing to me. I believe with a SEP IRA, you can save up to $66,000 a year in that. So there's a lot of opportunity. But let's just talk very quickly about employer plans, because that is the main place I see people saving, right? You're working for a company, you have an employer plan. And as I said, most plans now offer either pre-tax, which reduces your current tax bill, or post-tax Roth. Which one do you do? Well, as, as we tell many people who call our program, it depends. It could depend on your current tax rate and what you anticipate your tax rate to be when you retire. It depends on which bucket, if you will, you save more into. As I mentioned at the beginning of our chat, I truly believe that, uh, that you should have money in each place, pre-tax, a traditional uh, Roth, and then a brokerage, because when you get to the point, and if you're in your 40s or 50s or 60s, you're getting closer to the place where you're going to start drawing that money out. You're going to want to have play, you're going to want to have money in each one of those buckets, if you will, again, that will allow you to pull from those and uh, and and figure that out from a tax standpoint. People often forget, for example, that when you pull money out of a traditional uh, 401k or IRA, you pay tax on that. And we oftentimes remind people that when they come in and meet with us that you may have saved half a million dollars in your retirement account, but that's really only 400,000 by the time you give the government their piece of all this, right? So your savings is not as great as you may think it is. So the employer plan should be carefully thought about. And here's another thing, ran into this recently. If you have a hard time saving, you should at least save in that retirement plan up to the match that the employer provides. And there's some great matches out there. I think Boeing's at 6% now. Uh, just talked to somebody, I can't remember, another uh, another major employer is at 5%. That's a lot of money. So you should at least save up to that and get the free, absolutely free money. There's no reason to uh, not get that. Then there's these health savings accounts. And, and if you're in a plan that allows for that, there's a place you can save up to, I think, $7,500 per year. And in fact, uh, for the tax year 2022, you can still make a contribution here in the next few days. One of the few ways you can still save on your taxes for 2022. Uh, and I think most people don't know that. And in that particular account, because that is truly designed for health emergencies, I might split that between the, you know, like a bond or a, uh, a, a savings type of a vehicle, cash type of vehicle, and then stocks. Mine's a little more aggressive because I, if I had a problem, I could write the check for the healthcare, and I'm really using this as a long-term savings vehicle. But again, I think a split between those would be a, a reasonable approach. And then there's the good old Roth, Roth IRA, which goes back, I think it's about 23 or 24 years. It's still way underused for my taste um, because there's a couple of things to think about. Remembering that this grows tax-free, there is nothing else frankly, around that I know where you can put the money in and you get the growth and you take it out and you don't pay any tax on it. It's a wonderful vehicle. Um, it opens up all kinds of possibilities in retirement. And I know this talk is designed for 40 to 65 year olds, but if you have kids and grandkids, it is an absolute gift if you can get them started saving and you could do it in a Roth IRA. And I've just proud to say that my 15-year-old daughter, who's worked for her mother's pizza company a few summers, has actually had, you know, W-2 income and has a Roth IRA. And, you know, one day in 50 years when she starts to draw that, I won't be here, but hopefully she'll remember me fondly in some ways. Say, Dad made me start with that Roth. Look how big this is. And Paul, I think, has done some wonderful work on saving for young people and getting them going. But if you're working today and you're between 40 and 65, I would advocate, if you can afford it from a tax standpoint, current tax standpoint, that you 
put some money away in traditional and some money away in Roth. Sometimes just splitting the baby is a good, a good strategy over the long haul. And then for you self-employed folks, I mentioned SEP IRAs are out there. They're a wonderful tool. Um, you you can you can save the money there. You can and they're they're available at major custodians, and it's really not that hard to set up. And the costs are pretty doggone low. And you, again, you can invest in low cost index or index style uh, mutual funds or exchange traded funds. And then finally, the good old brokerage account, just your regular old account at Schwab, Fidelity, Vanguard, any major custodian where you can put that money in, it should be invested in a tax efficient manner. Um, I wouldn't own things like REITs in there. I wouldn't own actively managed funds there. I probably wouldn't have very many bond funds if I can there, because remember, they're paying out income that uh, that you may have to pay tax on. But all of these places are absolutely great things to do for your retirement. And again, that should be the high, in my mind, the highest priority. Of, obviously, once you have the emergency set up, Retirement should be next, and we'll, in a couple minutes, spend some time on actual portfolio development of all of that. So that'd be those would be the things to think about in terms of retirement. And then next on my list for you is paying for college. You know, this, unfortunately, I think many people believe they have, this is sort of a God-given right, they have to provide for their child's college. And as I regularly remind my clients, you know, the you you can borrow for college, um, and you can't borrow for retirement. Uh, and your retirement is really something that you, you should do well before paying for college for anybody. It should be the priority. Got to take care of yourself. I see too many people that think, now nah, I'm going to make sure my kid can go to a, a, a very nice school. And of course, as you know, the costs have appreciated way outside uh, of inflation for, for major uh, schools. But if you're going to do save for college, I love the 529 plan, which was set up by the government. It's a section 529. And it allows you to put money in. And then that money grows tax free until it's taken out and pay for educational expenses. Um, now, if you take it out and use it for something frivolous, you're going to pay tax on it. Uh, and by the way, they changed the rules a few years back. And now you can use it for secondary education as well. So it doesn't just have to be for, uh, for college. So 529 plans are a great way to save. It comes out tax-free to pay for any of those expenses. I love the plans and we can debate, I can debate this with Paul because he probably spends more time on this than I do, but I love the plans at Utah and at West Virginia. I love them so much that I, my grandson's got one at one and one at another because I want to see, see how the performance was between the two. And I, here's the part that is important. I use, and I'm in the business, the age-based plan. In other words, they do all the work. They, they so when the when the baby's born, Paul is a five month old grandchild. That money is all in stocks, right? It's the riskiest. It's going to be volatile, but you hope for 10, 11, 12 percent a year if you're lucky. And then as that child gets closer to, to college age, they reduce the exposure to stocks. They increase the exposure to bonds, remembering that a stock is equity in a company. There's a lot of very volatility to that. A bond is an IOU. So there's an aspect of uh, you'll get paid back, hopefully, with interest. So they do all that work for you. It's a wonderful uh, program. They do it at a very, very low cost. There's no commissions anymore. Remember when we started talking about these things, Paul, 20 plus years ago, there were all kinds of commissions, high expense plans that states had in place. But the age-based plans at Utah and West Virginia, I think, are very, very good. In addition, Secure Act 2.0, which was signed into law earlier this year, added something, a huge incentive, I think, for 529 plans. They're now going to allow you to take $35,000 out of that 529 and put it into the child's Roth IRA. Uh, and you, you, of course, the child still has to have earned income in the year that you make that contribution. And uh, the money, I believe, still has to be in there for the five years before you can start taking it out and doing that. I personally, I plan on, on, on the, and not spending all my daughter's 529 down and throwing that into a Roth at some point. It is another huge advantage for people that have saved in a 529 plan. So it's a great, absolutely wonderful advantage for people that set uh, set money aside for that. And then I this is my last on my list, uh, really. Uh, other real estate or boats or all those other fun things you got to save something for. Um, 
I don't, I guess I had mentioned, believe in investing money in stocks if you're going to need the money sooner than five years. So that's why I said CDs or high yield savings here. Um, I just think that you need the liquidity. You'd be putting it in stocks. You'd be hoping that the market went up. Don't know the market's going to go up during that five-year period. Um, so uh, that I think it's very important in those sort of invest investments, if you will, that you have it set aside in something that is extremely liquid. Further, um, and it comes to real estate, a lot of the questions we get around real estate are, you know, this is an investment that's going to make me more than anything else. Well, maybe. Uh, it's the real estate market in the Northwest and certainly the greater Seattle area has been phenomenal for the last 25 plus years. It really has been off the charts. If you look at the longer term rate of return on real estate coast to coast, for, I think for, going back to 1955, it's more like inflation plus 1%. It's not where we have enjoyed all these years. And when I hear those numbers, I think, we're going to go back to the mean. It's not going to continue to go off the charts this way. At some point, you run out of people, tech firms or whatever, are going to run out of people to keep uh, sending people to buy these fancy homes at high prices. So I think real estate shouldn't be necessarily an investment if unless you're going to turn it into a business, right? You're going to you're going to be in the business of you know uh, flipping homes or owning homes to make rental income. I truly that real estate should be a lifestyle decision. I'll give you an example. Um, one of my goals here and and uh, before too many years go by is to spend more time at this time of year in places that are sunny and warmer because I get tired like you do sometimes with this weather. And so I'm going to rent like I'm doing next week uh, down in Arizona. I'll rent a nice house, got my family coming with me and I might do that for a month, but I really do not plan on owning any other real estate other than than what I have. And let me add one more thing, because this comes up a lot in terms of real estate, and that is mortgages. People believe, and I think I heard Paul once say 25 years ago, it does not make sense to have a mortgage in retirement. I think that is more psychological than it is financial. For example, if you have a mortgage today and you've had it for more than five years, your mortgage shouldn't be more than two and a half or maybe 3%. Because if you refinanced as you should have a couple of years ago when rates are very low, the cost of that loan is very insignificant. Further, when you're in retirement, it's all about liquidity. You need cash to pay the bills, to take the trips, to do all those things. If you took a bunch of your cash and you paid off your home, now that money's locked up in that real estate and you can't get to it. In fact, one of the only ways you can would be a HELOC or a reverse mortgage, both of which can be very, very expensive. So real estate should be treated carefully I, for me. And I think hopefully for you, it should be more about lifestyle than it is about getting rich per se. And I think people, I think we're about to find that out in the Northwest. Who knows what the future holds, but I don't think it can continue up to the moon the way it has here in the last 25 years. All right. So actually building the portfolio, the investing part, the fun part, right? Because everybody wants to know about having dessert before they even get to the main course in my book. And you got to have the plan first before you can sort of say, all right, how do I, how do I make a lot of money? Well, employer plans. And, you know, it was a long time ago, we set up a website, uh, and I can't remember the the, uh, the URL, Paul, but uh, when I was at Merriman, we set up a website. We started analyzing uh, company retirement plans, 401ks, and I, it must have been 25 years ago because we did the plan for Amazon, and we put it up on the web, and we said, here's how to invest it, and here are the weaknesses in the plan, and, and I'll tell you what, they must have been watching the internet because they called within a couple hours and said, take that plan down, and don't worry, we're fixing our plan. We know there's shortcomings, but we're going to make it better, and that brings me to kind of employer plans in a general sense. The limitations generally are they don't have all of the assets, the groups of stocks we think you should own, and we're going to walk through those in a minute. They generally have actively managed high expense funds, right? These And the other part is oftentimes they still match uh, part of the money in company stock. I'm not a believer in owning individual stocks. I should have added that to my list, in fact, because individual stocks are just too risky. Companies come and companies go. The portfolios that we use, the portfolios that I think Paul supports own thousands of companies because some will become the next Microsoft one day and some will be Washington Mutual. We just don't 
generally know that ahead of time. We generally know if we've invested in a, what we think is a great firm that blows up in a very short period of time. You've just seen that recently in the banking industry, certainly. So in an employer plan, here's the way I look at it. First of all, how to pick the funds. I look at every employer plan and people send me tons of them every week. Um, I go through and and put a circle around the ones that are index funds. And generally they say index in them. If they don't, then generally they're an actively managed fund. And again, remembering that an index fund is just a group of stocks that's designed to look like a particular index. Could be the S&P 500, could be the Russell 2, could be the UEFA. It's an index that matches that particular uh, group of stocks. If, you're, if you own anything else, you're probably paying a high expense ratio, right? So you want to own index funds. Then part two is you got to figure out the asset classes that you have in there. In other words, one might be labeled Standard & Poor's 500, which is the 500 best companies in America, biggest and best. And interestingly enough, by the way, and we'll show you this here in a minute, to own far more than the S&P 500 has meant more money for you and is actually over time let, meant less volatility for you as well. And here's another interesting fact. The S&P 500 today um, is made up of about 13% in two stocks, two stocks, because Apple and uh, Microsoft have gone up rapidly this year where the index is sort of, I think it's still up about 7%, but nothing like those two funds. So now if you just hold the S&P 500, more than 10% of your money is in two stocks. And that's just too risky for me. Um, so the employer plan has those options. And then the part that you have to decide on, which is hard, is how much risk to take. And if you're between 40 and 65, you probably want to have some fixed income in your portfolio. Remembering fixed income is, uh, we I use that term interchangeably with bonds because it's the same type of security and it is an IOU. And here I believe in secure uh, fixed income. I don't believe in taking risk with things like high yield. I don't believe in emerging markets, other parts that might pay you a little bit more, but you're going to take volatility for doing so. The bonds for me should be the safe part of the portfolio. The stocks should give you the lift. So you're going to own some bonds, but how do you know how much? Well, we actually have a free risk quiz that you can go take a our website, go to talkingrealmoney.com, click on risk quiz. You get a little, you, you go through, you answer a series of questions about your emotions and about what you know about money. And it gives you a score. Yeah, that's something to consider. Um, but again, between 40 and 65, you probably need to have some fixed income. For me, by the way, investing is not necessarily about being the richest guy in the room because I'm, that's never going to happen for me. And, and so it doesn't matter. For me, it's about making the money I need to support my lifestyle and retirement. If anything left to my kids, that's great. But I'm not looking at home run. I'm looking for a series of singles and doubles. But that's how I look at a retirement plan. Again, finding the index fund, finding the right asset classes. We're going to show you here in a minute how to balance those and then deciding it for yourself. And remember, this is about you. Investing is not about what's going on in the world today, what might happen tomorrow, what's going to happen in the election next year. These things come at you every day. They're out there. And there's a lot of voices that are screaming at you about this and what's going to meet, go happen next. You need to tune all that out. You have a plan. Here's what you're trying to do for the long haul. You're saving, you're investing. The next crisis will be there no matter what happens. And then the second part of all this is the Roth IRA. You know, I love as I mentioned, the Roth, because it gives you this wonderful component of, of tax-free growth. Here's the great part about a Roth. For, for people that can do one, who, who uh, have their income limits, and I think for a married couple today, it's if your income exceeds, I think it's $215,000, you cannot do a Roth. But you can still do a thing called a backdoor Roth, which allows you to put money into an IRA and then immediately move it over to a Roth. The Roth gives you exposure oftentimes to other asset classes. Hate using that term because it sounds so uh, jargony, if you will. But these are things that often are not in retirement plans. U.S. small cap value stocks, which is something Paul has led a crusade on for the last 20 years to get you to invest in this because that has had the, going back 100 years, the best return for stocks. It's the most, I think, underutilized asset class. International, international small cap value, emerging markets. 
things that are traditionally are not in employer plans. So what you can do is you have the employer plan that gives you the base, right? Stocks and bonds. But then in this Roth, you have the unlimited portfolio options, the riskiest asset classes. And remember, those riskiest asset classes should provide the most growth, right? Because they, they're going up and down, but they're going up more than the other ones. So now your growth comes a lot in the Roth, which is tax-free growth. I think it's a fantastic uh, instrument. And again, for a young person, if you can get your kids, the minute that they have income, I mentioned my daughter, I'm proud that she has a Roth and I'm hoping to do the same for my grandkids because I think it gives them such a huge start. But remember, the minute they have income, you can put the money in that Roth. And there's some wonderful products there now. I uh, Before we started all this, I was talking to Paul about the Avantis Global uh, Equity Fund, AVGE. That is a globally diversified portfolio that tilts, if you will, to smaller and to more value stocks. It's very inexpensive. It's one fund. You got you know, no work. You just put the money in. And my hope would be you get double digit growth there. So it's it's fantastic. I mentioned the SEP and the simple. Again, the same principles hold here. You want to be globally diversified. You want to be low cost and you want to have the right mix of stocks and bonds. Now, this is the table maybe you've all been waiting for because this is where the rubber meets the road. And this is Paul and Paul's foundation work. And it's wonderful work. Frankly, it's fantastic that they produce this every year because it gives you a real look at how things work. But I'd urge you to, I'm only going to use the top part because it, it, the bottom is even more complex. And I know this looks like a lot, but it's pretty easy to decipher, actually. I figured it out. I'm not a big numbers guy. It sounds kind of funny to be in finance, but that's not my focus. My focus truly is people. And one of the great benefits of my job is I get to meet so many of you. And I absolutely love that. I think Paul referred to it once as eating chocolate cake every day, which I probably do. And I shouldn't do that either. But anyway, I mean, it's a wonderful thing to get to know so many people. But this is truly where the rubber meets the road because this is how stocks have acted over a long period of time. So this portfolio, and this he named this correctly 25 years ago, is the ultimate buy and hold equity portfolio. Why is he called the ultimate? Because it's the best we can find. It's the best looking at all these numbers to put together the portfolio. And as you can see at the top there, it says 50% US, 50% international. That means half of your stock exposure is in the United States, half is outside. And some of you are going to say, that's crazy. I'm an American. I love America. Well, me too, by the way. And maybe some of you can see the planes behind me. My father's in the U.S. Air Force. Great love of this country. But remember, almost half of the value now of firms is outside the United States and half is inside. So it's not unpatriotic to invest properly, to spread your assets over all of these places. But start with a column there on the left that says the S&P 500, because many of you know this index. It's regularly quoted uh, by everybody as kind of the, how this is how you invest. Uh, I wish, frankly, they'd regularly quote the Vanguard Global Fund or something else because I think it's more accurate. But this is the S&P 500, and this is 53 years of data. So I think it's fairly reliable to go back and say, yeah, this is how things have kind of acted. But what they're showing you here is the growth of $100,000, right, going back to 1970. And the only way we can get you this return is if you have a time machine. So I don't think we can do that, but I wish we could. But if you put that $100,000 in the S&P 500, by the end of last year, that, that grew to $18,900,000. Wow, that is significant growth, right? That's far more than you would have gotten in bonds or cash or other investments. It's been terrific. It's a great return, and it's to be truly admired. There's your, your annual growth rate, 10.4%. The standard deviation is the, the bounciness, the volatility. That's something to pay attention to. But the purpose behind this table is to show you if instead of just being in the S&P 500, you add in other asset classes, other groups of stocks that many of you don't own because you don't know about them, you don't know how to own them, it's complicated. But if you did, it makes a huge difference because look at the next column. So you have the S&P 500 and then you add in the LCV stands for large cap value stocks. The S&P 500 is mainly growth. The difference between growth and value, value firms are firms that uh, are underperforming. 
for whatever reason. The industry may be underperforming. All those things. They're beaten down. There's a guy named Warren Buffett who made a pretty good living buying value stocks. It worked out pretty well for Warren and still is apparently. So he owns those. And we use a mathematical equation that looks at sort of what the market says, the stock market says it's worth versus what the accountants say it's worth. That's a value stock. So you're buying these unloved, beaten down companies. And instead of just ending up with 18 million, now you end up with 20 million. Maybe that's pretty good. You made a little bit more return. I, I mean, I think it's fascinating too, by the way, that you end up with a significant more amount of money with just two tenths a year of difference of returns. This is something also many of you underrate. You think, well, if I make eight or nine, the difference between one or 2% over a long period of time is huge. That's another reason to use low cost index products because the higher cost is simply money that's coming out of your portfolio going into someone else's. It's it's an expensive way to operate. I'll put it that way. Then the next, oh, pardon me. I just, I didn't mean to do that. Um, <clears throat> if I can go back here, the next column is important because it shows you adding in another, uh, another asset class here, the U.S. small cap blend. These are and when we refer to the size of a company, we're referring to the market capitalization. You know the huge companies, right? I just mentioned Apple and I mentioned Microsoft and Tesla and all these big, huge firms that have grown so dramatically. You don't know the small ones. You don't hear about them regularly unless something goes wrong. But as an asset class, as a group of stocks, they've added significantly to your portfolio. So the next column, we're simply saying, let's add in small cap blend. But more importantly, the next column, let's add in U.S. small cap value stocks, smaller firms that are sort of undervalued, if you were. Look at your $18 million is now worth $27 million, a huge difference, if you will, right? And so adding that very important asset class added $5 million more. You didn't have to do a thing. You don't have to be any smarter. You don't have to read the Wall Street Journal. You don't have to listen to Talking Real Money. You have to listen to Paul, all that stuff. All you do is invest this way and you let it ride. Now you do have to annually rebalance back to the correct percentages, right? But in a general sense, your workload is pretty low. You're, you're better off than the people on Wall Street who at, have to perform well every quarter or they lose their jobs. You don't have to worry about any of those things. You simply are diversifying the portfolio. The next column is REITs, Real Estate Investment Trust. I mentioned... I would not recommend non-traded uh, REITs. These are tradable REITs. These are companies that own um, commercial real estate, apartments. I used to say shopping malls. I don't know if there's anything that exists other than Bellevue Square anymore in terms of shopping malls. So those are all, those are an asset class that actually you can see they don't add much to the return, but they, they sort of counterbalance. They, they don't go up and down together with everything else. They have sort of different return uh, characteristics, if you will, and that has helped. I keep doing that and I apologize for moving this thing forward when I don't mean to. So that would be another one to have in your portfolio. Then um, you want to, if you can, add international, which many of you do not own. And I'm going to apologize again for clicking. I guess I'll stop clicking. International, as you can see, adds a huge amount to the portfolio, okay? It adds another, uh, your initial return with the S&P 500 was 10.4. International makes it 11.7. Huge difference. And then the final column here, taking it all the way up to, and I'm having trouble getting to it. That's what I was trying to do because my picture's in the way here. Um, it takes it up to over 12% a year. And many of you will come in, by the way, when I meet with you and say, just circle that. I'll just take the 12% a year. And as I mentioned, you can't do that unless we can go back to 1970. But I do really believe that those asset classes are important to own, no matter what the future may bring, no matter how all this shakes out, because diversification is truly the one thing you can do. It's, it's the one free lunch on Wall Street. And I'll tell you what it does. It assures you exposure to all of these parts that uh, that one may be great, one may not be. And I'll go back. It wasn't that long ago, 2000 through 2009. The S&P 500, the column all there on the left, actually had a losing decade. You remember we, they referred to it as a lost decade, where if you had all the rest of this diversification, you made about five and a half percent per year huge difference. Doesn't always work out. By the way, in fact, since the uh, Great Recession of 2008, the uh, the S&P 500 has outperformed these other asset classes. 
But over the long haul, you can see it that by being diversified, you've uh, you've made more money. You've had to deal with more volatility, right? The portfolio has gone up and down. So the idea here is to show you that diversification works, that you need to own other asset classes that may be hard for you to buy, right? Because your 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 employer plan may not have U.S. small cap value, but you could go own it in your Roth IRA. You could own it in a brokerage account. There's other places you could own it. And you need to have that in your portfolio. I'll put it that way. So, and it's it it it's underutilized. And I, and I want to thank Paul again for being the guy that um, that regularly uh, that regularly touts all of this. Um, so, asset allocation. I mentioned sort of owning all these things. Here's the part that's the toughest of, out of all this. It's it's uh, Paul and I were talking about at, when this ends, we get to go have dinner. It's the discipline to all this. It's it's sitting at the table, knowing when to push yourself away. You got to know yourself about money. You got to know yourself about uh, how you deal with risk or ups and downs. It's a fascinating thing that we have looked at the behavioral part of all this for years. We're all built differently, and and uh, and and people's feelings about risk of loss. I'm okay with seeing my portfolio go down a lot because number one, I'm still working because number two, I've seen that happen many times. And for number three, I have a belief in, in companies, in businesses. And that's when you're investing in the stock market. That's what your belief is in. I've owned a lot of businesses since the, since I, I started the Holly Jolly Berry company at age 11. So I I've had a lot of, and some have worked as Paul knows, and some haven't worked. Not unlike a lot of other businesses, but that's when you invest in stocks. That's, that's what you're doing. You have to trust in that. And the stock market is not a mysterious thing. It truly is a vote on capitalism, if you will, every day. So you need to know yourself. I mentioned the, uh, <clears throat> the risk quiz. You can go take that at any time at Talking Real Money. Number two, you've got to diversify. You really should try to own thousands of companies if you can. If you can't, then you need to find a way to, to do that in other, in other uh, parts of, as I said, in a Roth or a brokerage account. You need to watch your expenses. Um, I, I think I did say that we look at people's portfolios. We do this free where we analyze them. I'm always shocked that people don't know that they're paying sometimes an advisor one and a half percent. And then on top of that, they're in mutual funds that are charging 0.8. They're paying over 2% of their money to somebody else. That's paying for some other kid's education. That's paying for somebody else's vacation, not yours. You got to know what you're paying others. Uh, number four here, this becomes more important as, we, as we're in our 40s, 50s, and 60s, certainly, is knowing your time horizon. I mentioned mine is still, I hope, more than five years. Um, <laughs> we're negotiating a new deal for me right now with my partners. I'm, I'm hoping to keep working because I like working. I enjoy it. I, I think they want me to. But you need to start thinking about how soon you're going to need to draw that money. Because one of the biggest mistakes I see is people get to retirement. They do not have a withdrawal plan. And by the way, um, you've got some wonderful – Christine Benz is a fantastic speaker, truly knowledgeable and uh, I think Mary Beth Franklin on Social Security, she's one of the top experts in the country. So you're lucky to have Paul Merriman there at Bainbridge has really got some wonderful, wonderful speakers coming up. And Social Security, again, is the, it's still like 40 plus percent of people that wake up at age 62 and take it, which is absolutely tragic because you're locking in a low benefit. But you need to know your time horizon. You need to know how long until you're going to need that money. As I said, if, if you're within five years of needing it, you need to have something in fixed income that is going to uh, supply the, the, the ballast when stocks go down. And by the way, yes, I know bonds had a very difficult year last year, a very unusually difficult year. And it was a strange year because you had stocks and bonds go down. I still believe in fixed income. I still believe in the debt of the United States. And by the way, if you've noticed bond funds this year, I look at uh, DFIGX, that is Dimensional's Intermediate Term Government Bond Fund, it's up almost 4%. Because if you go look at what it holds, it's a fascinating thing. The, the bonds that they have that are these six or seven year bonds, those are starting to come up that we're paying one and 2%. Those are going away. All the new paper they're buying is four, three and a half. So they're starting to get this new paper and it's going to start yielding the way bonds used to. So for people who are savers, I think we're going to get into a better place with fixed income. Here's some recommendations that, and this, again, 
your portfolio design, your portfolio balance is about you. It's not about me telling you. People oftentimes come in our office and say, well, what do you think I should do? And I say, you know, I have no idea. You need to have a plan first to know what kind, what rate of return you need, not what rate of return you want. We always want more. But then you put that in place. I say at age 40, maybe you have none in fixed income. If you can take the heat of seeing your portfolio down by half, then that's okay. If you can't, then you need to add fixed income to sort of alleviate those uh, those bumps. At age 50, you know, 80% in stocks, 20% in bonds. I think I've publicly said I'm 65 and I still have 80% in, in stocks and 20% in bonds. I may have that till I die. I don't know. I'm okay with the volatility. And um, my wife, by the way, is more conservative than I am. We come from very different backgrounds and she she has a fear of loss much greater than I do. And so she, her portfolio is 60, 60, 40. This managed differently than mine because she's scared of, she remembers how bad it all was in 2008, 2009. So at age 60, maybe it's a 60, 40. That's 60% in a globally diversified portfolio of stocks and 40% in bonds. And before we get to some of your questions real quick, I just want to tell you some of the the, the the mistakes I see as a practitioner. And as I said, I'm blessed because I get to talk to so many people. Uh, people either have way too much in stocks or way too much in bonds, and they don't know it. They they have built a portfolio once, maybe when they're 25, the money keeps piling up. And remember, if the money keeps piling up, it's going to pile up way faster in stocks than it is in bonds. So they don't know that. Most of you do not hold small and value stocks. Uh, the reality is it's harder to buy. The reality is it's not in very many employer plans. So you have to go buy it on your own. Uh, both dimensional funds and Avantis funds have terrific portfolios of small cap value funds. You can buy them exchange traded funds. Now they're very inexpensive. Most people do not pay attention to fees. They hire somebody that they like. They have an emotional connection to that person or their parents had one. We trust them. We're taking care of it. And then when we pull that portfolio apart, as I said, oftentimes the expense can be one and a half, two, two and a half percent a year, which is just in today's world, you don't have to pay that much. And here's another one that I see regularly. And because a lot of people call the show, what should I do now? The market's down, right? What should I, I've got to do something here. And the reality is, as John Bogle, I think famously once said, you know, stand up and do nothing or sit down and do nothing. Because if you have a plan, if you know what you're trying to achieve, your portfolio is about you. It is not about the market because the market is going to do whatever the market's going to do. Hopefully, uh, as I say, we're getting ready for turning that around here, but uh, but we never know. Even Paul doesn't know what direction the market's going to head from here. Um I put my my email. I'm always happy to answer any questions. As I said, uh, talking real money, we can we can you can send us questions there. We're blessed because Paul sort of understates the fine work that we were able to do together in 2008. Uh, uh, um, uh, sound investing that we did with our friend Don McDonald was picked as the top money podcast by Money Magazine. And that was a lot of fun to do that show and sound investing still available. You do a great job with that. We've been lucky with Talking Real Money that is now, I think, in the top 60 investing podcasts. So that's that's fantastic as well. I think I'm at my time here, Paul. I don't want to overstay my welcome. I've tried to be careful about I, that kind of thing. Uh, I, I thought things. that was great, Tom. And, and yes, there are some questions. But before we take the questions, I, I want to make a comment about that ultimate buy and hold uh, portfolio. Portfolio. Uh, each time you added money, it was ten percent, and and so by the time you have the ten different asset classes in there, that uh, you've got all those ten percent pieces. Also, just to make it clear, when that international comes in there, it's 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 four ten percent pieces that because it's the large cap blend value small etc so uh, it is a massive diversification and oh if the next 40 or 50 years could be like the last it would be wonderful uh, for well, for both of us by the way i'm hoping the next 40 looks the same for me as it did last <laughs> one. And, and by the way i want to for people that do not know if you go to paulmerriman.com, Paul has wonderful portfolios at Schwab, Fidelity, Vanguard that you you can just go use. And they're very sophisticated and and frankly, they're as good as a lot of advisors give you. So they're they're great. The the, the difference between doing something like that and hiring somebody like me is you got to do the work and you got to stay the course. 
and you got to rebalance. But but many people do that. They're wonderful uh, do-it-yourself investors. But Paul, bless you, because he's made all of this absolutely free to you. So you can go there and get on with your financial life in a terrific way. Well, uh, I, I do know that that more people than not need some guidance and some help. Let me let me shoot a couple of questions at you here. Paul asked about this 15% savings rate. Is that of your gross, of your net? And I would add, do you include the, the company match or is that the bonus on top of the 15? You know, I'm going to say it's of your gross and I say the company match is the bonus. Um, the reality is, and I don't think I mentioned this, but I meant to, we all forget about taxes and expenses. Uh, it's I just did my spreadsheet at the beginning of the year where I and I only look at my money twice a year, beginning and middle. And I put my house in. Here's how much a house is worth. And here's what I owe on it. I keep paying down what I owe. But here's the thing I forgot. It's not worth that. Because when I go to sell that, I'm going to pay somebody. I mean, all in with excise, etc. It's somewhere between six and 10%. So the true value, what's going to come to me is less. When you save money pre-tax in a 401k or IRA, that money is going to come out and you're going to give the government, you know, 12, 20, whatever percent of that. So it's actually less. So yes, I'd prefer 15 of the gross plus the, uh, plus the, the match would be the bonus on top of that. That's great. And Wendy asked about the Roth limits, the difference between a Roth IRA and a Roth 401k. So in the, anybody can do a Roth 401k. There are no, I was talking, there's two limits. There's the uh, income limit. If you want to do a Roth IRA and you're married, I think the, you can't have any income above, I always, they always change it on me. So I think it's about $215,000, something in that area. And if you're single, it's significantly less. But anybody, if you have a 401k, Roth can do that. There's no limit. Number two, um, I believe the for you young whippersnappers under the age of 50, I think you can do six thousand dollars in a Roth this year. And I think I think us old people can do seventy five hundred. Um, and 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 certainly this discussion about and I'll just weigh in here a, a little bit on the use of the Roth versus the regular uh, IRA. I've always been afraid that life might li look like it was when I went into the securities business in 1966. And the marginal tax rate at that time was uh, about said the highest was 70%. The previous wow. year, it was 90%. And, 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 and when, I, when I see the problems we have in funding potentially funding uh, Social Security and the debt that, that we are accumulating, it will not surprise me that in the future we might have a higher tax rate. So even though it may not be viewed as exactly the perfect thing to do to take the Roth, but when you do that Roth, you do not get a refund. You do not blow that refund on a vacation. It stays in there and it is earning that money to be tax-free. So, so that's just a, a side comment. No, it's a good it's a good comment. And by the way, in terms of taxes, and we're not going to debate this because I'm going to let you carry the day, but I will say I take current tax policy as tax policy. Because no, I don't think even though with the sunset of a bunch of stuff, I think after 2025, nobody knows what's going to happen. But but you're right. Having Roth is a great advantage. Huge. Yeah. So Michelle wants to know. Uh, you made the comment that first you do the the four hundred one k the retirement money, and then you do the a uh, college education and other things. Um, but that is a little bit of a challenge because how is Michelle going to know when she has put enough away into retirement that she could start doing this other thing? Because without some sort of a table that, that Michelle should know that she has to have a certain amount of saved for, for the long term. I mean, is this a job for a financial planner to help her figure that out? Or what would what's your advice? Yeah, I, I yes, I think a, a good planner could certainly do that. But I think there's also online calculators that could help you kind of say, if I save this much, if I make six percent a year where do i end up and if i have this if i have half a million dollars in 20 years what does that really mean um 
You know, that's a very difficult question because our lives change too, right? Um, you know, uh, I worked for you. I made a very good living. Then I went a couple of years, started this firm, made nothing for a couple of years. So it all, that all changed. Now I make good money again. So yeah, that, that's very difficult. I mean, my still my my point, if, if it was close, I would put my money in the 401. I would make sure, and, and in today's world, you can, I think with the 401ks, you can put in uh, for under the age of 50, $22,500 this year. So if you max that, then you know, you know, there's nothing more you can do there anyway, that, and then maybe a Roth, then you would be inclined to do the, uh, the 529. But I don't think I have a great answer for that um, other than either finding an online calculator or talking to a financial advisor. Well, and there That's is a great question, by the way, for Christine Benz next week. Yeah, you're probably... right. You're right. Yeah. And and there's a question that kind of sits on the edge of what you're talking about today and what she'll talk about next week. And that is, how much do you need to retire? And And from 40 to 65, that's where most of the money is going to be invested uh, for folks. And, and so... If they don't know what that amount is, and of course, this goes back to that plan you want them to, to, to make, uh, then how can you know how much you have to save? How can you know how much risk to take? How can you know what you want for or need for a return? And, and, and so those are moving parts that we have to sit here, at, and I'm not a planner, but we have to sit here and make a judgment about something 25 years from now but we still have to try to do that. So, so what is your simple formula for how much money you need to have set aside? Uh, you know, I think there's, I think there's some pretty good research that says you have to have 20 times your current salary at retirement saved, which sounds like a lot, but I think that that's a number you hear from time to time. Again, um, that is really, it's just a very difficult judgment for me to make, even as somebody who does a lot of planning. Um, and, and most of the work that we do is for people who are 50 years old and older, so yeah. they have a certain amount and we can pretty well say, if you keep doing this for another 10 years, 15 years, whatever, here's where you could end up. We don't know what the market's going to be like for the next 10 or 15 years. Um, but when you get younger than that, I, there's just a lot of moving parts. That's why I would say either max it out, do the 15, get the match. And then if there's anything left, you do the education after that. And there are a lot of people who believe it should be 20, not 15. Yeah. I mean, that, that, uh, and there are a lot of people who believe that young people today are going to work till they're 70. Uh, and I hope well, so. They keep paying my social security. That's what I that's right. Yeah, we need that. But, but, but it does also in that planning process, I'm not sure that having that 20 times, by the way, 20 times would, would suggest a 5% distribution as opposed to 25 times would represent a 4% distribution. But there are a lot of us who feel that we should be trying to save for more than enough, not because that we're, we want to be uh, rich or we want to have a lot of money just to have a lot of money, but because things don't work the way we expect them to. Life isn't as as uh, as simple as as the plan and that things come up and then all of a sudden we didn't save enough so uh, i just happened to come down on the save more than you than than you need Uh, let's let me ask here's a question from alan he says what about money market funds for cash right now at vanguard you can get 4.75 percent yeah i mean i would again a little bit depends on whose money market fund it is because this has all come into question since the bank meltdown. I mean, I would probably want to use the, um, I think Schwab as a, a government or federal money market fund is paying that. I think that's a very reasonable approach. I, I see no issue with that. Those are all, that's what I'm saying. It, with all of those sort of cash instruments, now you can make something. Um, I'm pretty comfortable with the high yield savings. I've used that for a long time. And uh, I can move the money back and forth very quickly, but you can do the same thing in the money market. I think that's a perfectly legitimate method of doing it. Yeah, can I answer a question, Tom, here? The, it, yeah. It, oh, well, no, it's addressed to me. I see. Where can I find the best funds to invest for each category for portfolio seven uh, in that in the table, the ultimate buy and hold table? And we actually have uh, on our website, paulmerriman.com, Go to portfolios, 
Uh, and then you go to ET, you'll see ETFs, click on ETFs. Then you go to best in class ETFs. And uh, uh, Chris Pedersen, our director of research, has spent many, many hours going through every asset class and finding one that, that he considers to be uh, the best. And he's been doing this for years now and doing a great job. Now, here is a question. Does the evidence from Ricky, does the evidence support the same expected premium of it for international small cap value versus U.S. small cap value, uh, or is the evidence more shoddy? I, you know what? I, I'm, I'm going to just say I don't know. I'm going to let you answer that. I don't know. I will. It's, I'm it's happy to. Yeah, I mean, that, Ricky is right. The evidence is more shoddy, and it's not because it's shoddy in a bad way. It's because we have small cap value returns that the academics have pulled out of all of the returns going back to 1928 in the US. We do not have that in the international. But I will tell you, if you look at, uh, we have a piece coming out just in the, uh, in fact, it's out today, I think, uh, on YouTube uh, about the different portfolios that we recommend. And it shows that going back to 1970, the international small cap value with the U.S. small cap value had a one-tenth of 1% 1 better return. But, you know, it, it's who knows how that's going to be. But what we do know, and we do know from the academic research, that small cap value pays a premium in international markets as it does in the U.S. So... Uh, I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand up for the international markets here just for a moment for a couple of reasons. First of all, as I mentioned, the U.S. market has been far better, especially large companies, since the Great Recession of 2008 2009. So, would you rather buy something that's been great or buy something that's been out of out of favor? Number two, this great country that we live in was an emerging market 150 years ago. You were lucky to get your money back from bonds. You could buy railroad stocks that would go bankrupt. This was a wild place financially. And look where we are today. So you tell me, where's a better opportunity? In places like that that could come along and do great, you move your money out to all those places. I still think there's more opportunity there. We'll see what the future, what it does. But I would want to sprinkle some of that everywhere because I don't know what's going to be best. Well, and Tom, I might mention, that because that is a 50-50 split, the table that yeah. you shared, mm -hmm. uh, we also have done that same study for 70% U.S., 30% uh, uh, international. So, And that's come up, as you know, Paul, I mean, the U.S. It, the US and international was about 50-50 in terms of market cap about 10 or 11 years ago. Today, it's closer to 60% U.S. Mar yeah. market cap in the U.S. 40. So we manage... Uh, privately to about 60, 40 now. So Ricky asked, when de-risking in retirement and adding more bonds, should you also lower risk by lowering your small cap value allocation? And I guess just to ask it a, a little more about that, Tom, this idea of changing fixed income as you get older, do you also recommend changing the equity asset allocation to a more conservative? Now, there are people that do that. Our friend Larry Swedro, I believe, recommends that. He sort of de-risks the stocks. I do not. Um, but I, I think it's a reasonable approach. I think I think going on a glide path from more stocks to less stocks will do it enough for you. But I, I have all the respect in the world for Larry's work, and I think that's a reasonable... I, I, I think you're splitting hairs a bit there, and I don't think it's anything really to be that excited or worried about. But I know he does, and there are others that say, yeah, you should do, should lower the risk of the stocks as well. I'm going to keep trying to make as much money in stocks, and if I want to you know, sort of reduce the volatility in my portfolio, I'll just own more fixed income. And that's what my wife and I have done, Tom, is, is to remain committed to the balance of small and large and value and and blend and U.S. and international, but we're 50% fixed income. Yeah. So, uh, and by the way, uh, that raises the question about the fixed income that one has in their portfolio. How does that relate to, to the emergency money that you have? If I have 50% in fixed income, and some of that is short-term fixed income, do I need to have an additional emergency pool? 
You know, I'd say no, but it's a psychological thing. If you looked at my life, I have almost none in cash. I have a little bit in high yield savings, but I could at any time go to my brokerage account and get fixed income that really has very little capital gains in it um, and use that for an emergency. You know, like if I need, need to get a new roof or something like that, I could go get that money pretty easily. So it depends a little bit on your situation, but it also, I think, depends on your psychology. People oftentimes think money when they have it in a brokerage account. I can't touch that which you definitely can, but it uh, gets in your head a little bit. So I think having something in an emergency fund makes sense. What you don't want to do is have it all in retirement accounts and have no emergency savings and have to pull from those retirement accounts. We see that on a regular basis, and that makes me sad because you not only pay the tax, you pay the penalty as well if it's before 59 and a half. So. That's great. And Dan asked, he says, uh, if one expects a pension that will cover annual projected expenses in retirement, is that justification for holding little to no bonds or can bonds still be useful for rebalancing purposes to take advantage of stock market underperformance from time to time? And the short answer is yes. And I'll give you a great example, the spring of 2020. Um, the bond portfolio we manage was up about 10% in those three months. We can all remember spring of 2020. Um, and the stock portfolio was down like 30% in a very short period of time. So we were selling those bonds and buying stocks. We look like geniuses, had nothing to do with us being smart, simply a yeah. disciplined approach. So in that case, it pays off. Here's my only caution to people that say, and they say this about social security, the same way I get a regular check. If you're okay with seeing your portfolio do this, then yes. If you're not, then do not go ahead and put it all in stocks because I get this regular income that's a fixed income. Most of the reason people should own bonds is because they can't take the volatility. out. And I just mentioned the spring of 2020. That was a time we were getting a lot of calls from people saying, this is the end of the world. This has never happened before. We've never had a pandemic, forgetting that we had one 100 years ago, et cetera, et cetera. I got to do something. And that's when people make bad decisions that cost them thousands of dollars, could cost your retirement. So, but if you're okay with, with volatility, Paul owns bonds because he doesn't like to see his portfolio go up and down. That's why. Well, and, and there's the other aspect about having a pension and then social security, and that covers your cost of living. Then you really have to ask yourself, who is this other money for? And if that other money is for young people, younger people, that there are some people who would say invest for their risk tolerance, not yours, if it truly is going to be for them. So I think that's exactly right. Yeah. And I think people, um, we regularly urge people that have been great savers to put that all in stocks or put that even in a riskiest asset class. I think you had a, didn't you used to have a, the trust that you talked about where you put it all in US small cap value and hope that that gets the 12 or 13% a year for a long period. Think of the think of the, what that means to a young person. Absolutely. Yeah. There are a whole bunch of questions here, Tom. I'm going to let's, let's zip through them. In my 401k, there's a small cap value fund, but it has an expense ratio of 0.85%. Is it too expensive relative to the bump in return over S&P 500 alone? You know, I'm going to say yes, but... The only reason, if if you're not willing to go open a Roth or brokerage account and buy uh, a, a dimensional product or an Avantis product there, or even Paul's got some Schwab products on his website or Fidelity, if you're not willing to do that and you're only going to own the small cap value in your 401k, then you're going to have to swallow hard and, and buy that for 85.85. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, you're going somewhere else. Yeah, and the problem is that 0.85 does suggest active management, number yep. one, mm -hmm. and number two, probably not a whole lot of diversification. And that's an asset class where you do want a whole lot of diversification yep. in an index-like way. So uh, uh, now, uh, Tom, somebody has has asked whether that list that you that you read at the beginning will you will you post that list somewhere? All the things we shouldn't do, yeah. And and where could they go get that? Uh, uh, that no, list? I'll I'll send it to you, and you can decide what flagpole to run it up. So oh yeah, put me to work. Okay, that's a deal. <laughs> You're retired. You got lots of time. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, what additional advice can you share for a 403b target funds for educators? I, let's just talk target date funds. Period. How do you feel about it? You know, I 
I, for people that don't want to spend any time on all of this and just want a product that's going to take care of it, I'm okay with that. I love the work that you've done that says target date fund plus 20% US small cap value or small cap value of some type. Mm -hmm. Target date funds, I think, get a bad name. I was just reading a piece that oh, they didn't perform very well in 2022. Well, no kidding. Stocks yeah. and bonds lost money. Yeah. Um, oh, they didn't do exactly what they're, but in a general sense, they give you balance. You know, and a, the, the thing that you and I don't like about them is they mo mainly own large U.S. large cap growth kind of stocks. Mm -hmm. They assume because you're 60 years old, your portfolio should be 60 percent in stocks and 40 percent in bonds. And maybe it shouldn't. I mean, you and I had very different portfolios at 65, a different just different feelings about the future. Right. And different. Our, our risk makeup is different. But other than that, I think they're they're okay. Again, and if it's for, you don't want to spend any time on this, and you just want to own a fund and you put it in there, I think that's fine. I would, however, still t use your approach, which I love, is the target date fund plus the twenty percent in a small cap value fund. Yeah, and if people want to, we offer a free copy of a book called two books actually. One is called "We're Talking Millions: Twelve Simple." Ways to Supercharge Your Retirement. The second book is called Two Funds for Life. Both of those books uh, have a major part uh, focus on combining a target date fund and a second fund to make up for the target date shortfalls. And I'm sure, and this person who wrote the uh, question is out of California, uh, I, I, and I'm sure you uh, are probably got a BlackRock or a Vanguard uh, uh, target date fund, and they should serve you well. Studies. I love this study out of Wharton. It was a combination study between Vanguard and uh, uh, and Wharton. They looked at 1.2 million 401k accounts. Some of them had all target date funds. Some of them were do-it-yourself investors, no target date funds. And the expected additional return of those that used the target date funds was 2.3% a year more return. And I'm and and when we know that every half a percent that we can make more on our investments can lead to potentially another million dollars, 2% is a big, big deal. So I am a fan, even though they they do have weaknesses. Uh, here's an, a question. I'm currently running an ultimate buy and hold at Schwab. My question is about rebalancing. I've been rebalancing by selling a to cash if a fund share of the portfolio exceeds 11% and buying when the fund is below 9% would appreciate your comments. You know something? That's fine. I mean, that's one of many ways you could do it. And by the way, Tom, didn't have time to get to it, but now you can use four funds. Uh, we've got the research and show you how to do the what the 10 did. Uh -huh. uh, any tip, Michelle here, any tips for understanding asset classes for your whole portfolio, if you have parts for your spouse and your brokerage and your Roth or into asset class location, what do you got to say? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned this briefly, you know, that, that the riskier things would hopefully be in a Roth, that the tax efficient things would be in a brokerage account. And then the other stuff would be in the pre-tax because you don't care what happened there from a tax standpoint. Um but other than that, no, other than to say that you do need to look at your portfolio as a whole and because make sure everything's sort of pulling in the right direction. Um, so, yes, you need to look at your spouses, what all those assets you have to make sure you're properly diversified, make sure it fits your risk return sort of ratios, all that stuff. So, but yeah, the pre-tax again, pre-tax can often be bonds and those sort of things. The Roth could be, as, as we talked about, the riskier things. And the brokerage should probably be mostly stocks as well. Uh, question here about real estate. Uh, is your recommendation not to manage rentals as part of your portfolio because they don't perform, perform as well as investing using the ultimate buy and hold strategy? You know, I, I would just say, one, I don't want to be in the real estate business. And, and uh, that is a business to be in and a very profitable business to be in if you know how to do it and want to do it. We're talking passive investing here where you don't have to do anything, but you own these parts of these companies all over the world 
People go to work for those companies. They're complaining about how hard they're working. They're asking for more money. It's the pitch. The boss hates it. You don't have to do anything about it. You just sit there and you uh, collect the dividends or you hopefully watch them go up. Uh, it's passive. Yeah, uh, I mean, this is the reason that I really stress the real estate part is if you go look at the top investing podcasts, out of the 30, the last time I counted, like 27 of them are about real estate, about how you get rich doing this, it's passive income. It's nonsense. You know, my business is not passive. I get up every morning and I go to work. My wife's pizza business, it's not passive. She goes, I mean, so we're operators. And I think to be in the real estate business is a business, as you said. So don't think it's going to be easy. You're going to plunk something down. You're going to start getting these checks. That's my point about all that. So I think you're spot on. So Michelle, opening an account for a child, is there a way to prevent them from taking over the account and taking the money out? Well, if it's if it is a Uniform Gift to Minors Act or an IRA, either either way, taxable or an IRA, yes, they probably at age 18 are going to have access to it. What you do is you explain what you have done for them. You have the statements come to your home, your address, not to theirs, and you tell them. I told my kids this, if you touch this money for anything else, I mean, you leave it in these IRAs to grow. If you touch it, that's the last money you ever get from us. I mean, that's that was the deal. And I spoke to my 58-year-old son recently, and he agreed he believed me. So, so yes, yeah. you, can legal, you can't legally do it. It's there. And by the way, I mean, there's another suggestion, um, you know, and I use this sometimes with my 15 year old, just ignore them until they're about 18 or 19. And then you don't have to get that. No discussion. No, that's kidding. But you're right. I love the fact you tell them if you take any of that out, then then that's it. You're, you're sort of cut off. But other than that, no, there's no legal way to prevent that. You know, some people, I don't think, tell them about it. So Right. Fine. Right. I mean, and that the problem is that's OK, I think, with the Roth. Yeah. But I think Uncle Sam wants to know if you've got a, a uh, deductible IRA out there. Uh, and you, so you got to tell the kid it's, at, at some point. Uh, what's the best strategy for transitioning to what I have now to what I want to move to? Okay, first, uh, take, it, take it in an IRA, 401. Yeah, I mean, in an IRA, that's, you're going to sell the securities and buy new securities. That's easy. It's when you start getting into the brokerage type or, you know, money at, uh, that's not protected uh, that you got to be careful. Uh, for example, looked at a portfolio today that's 72% in, and it's millions of dollars in Microsoft stock. So you don't want to just run out and sell all that because the basis is here. That's this much. You're going to pay tax on all that. Um, so it should be it's just done carefully. It can be done over time. There's other strategies uh, and not to get too far in this, but there's separate account management. But there's ways you can own other securities and you tax loss harvest that stuff. But so there's ways to do it. I mean, uh, but there's no trick to it all. I wouldn't say that. Michelle asks, are these recommendations 20 times uh or 25 times uh, the, the, the formula uh, for what you're going to take out. Um, does that apply to retiring early? I, I want to suggest anybody who wants to see the impact of, of taking money out of investments over a very long period of time, uh, go to paulmerriman.com, click on best advice, and look at the distribution tables. Uh, we have tables taken out three, four, five percent, six percent over a 50 plus year period. For you folks wanting to retire when you're 40, please look at what the risk might be. Yeah, the fire movement. I know you've talked to those folks. I mean, that is so hard because so much in your life could change in that period of time. So it's it feels incredibly risky to me. But um, but sure, there's ways to make that work. Here's and I think we're we're probably Jim's going to take a a, a a a noose, but no, no. What do they call it? The hook, the hook. Yeah. Hey, uh, this is a good one. Uh, any advice regarding U.S. government thrift savings plans, the TSP? Should I move a Schwab Roth IRA to TSP? And let me ask it the other way around. Should I move a TSP to a Schwab IRA? Account. Well, 
you know, it's like a lot of the answers I give on the show. It depends. But here's the thing. The TSP has some advantages and some disadvantages. The advantages it has is very low cost. The advantages it has, it has a bond fund that issues bonds that I can't buy. Um, the disadvantages, it does not have the diversification I think you should have. It does not have much of much of a value component. The small isn't particularly small. The international is mainly large cap. So it doesn't, where, where you look at Paul's ultimate, you know, buy and hold strategy, it doesn't have those things. And I want to reiterate that because this is another thing people think. Well, I've got, I kind of do what you're telling me and it's going to work out. No, it won't. You need, if you're going to do this right, and we run into this all the time where people say, I've listened to your show for 20 years. And then they, you bring the portfolio. Which part were you listening to? I didn't say to do that. So the TSP does have some very good things. I would personally build, and I, we have recommendations at our, our website, 401411. I don't know if you have the same, Paul, but we have TSP portfolio recommendations. And then I would take other money and build around that so that you do have a value component. You do have more international. So but when you look at the whole thing, it's got this sort of globally diversified portfolio with some of those tilts in it that have added a return. And one last question here, Tom. Uh, I, I'd like us both to answer it. You can go first. The investing <laughs> philosophy presented tonight has much in common with the Boglehead philosophy. By the way, I am speaking at the Boglehead conference uh, in Maryland uh, in October. Uh, oh. But they embrace simplicity as well. In light of that, is there a single ETF or mutual fund that represents portfolio seven? And if not, why not? So okay, but mine is I'll go I'll go first. I think AVGE does it pretty doggone well. It's one exchange traded fund. It's operated by Avantis. It is a globally diversified equity portfolio that has tilts to small and to value. So yeah, I think it does. I think it's again, if I was if I had a young person's Roth IRA, that'd be the one stop I'd make. So simplicity is an interesting question uh, because my wife and I have three dogs and uh, some people think we're crazy. We think it's simple, but so let me tell you what I would do. And by the way, you just mentioned uh, for a young person, uh, mm -hmm. I love, it only takes two funds, the S&P 500, that gives you growth and it gives you large, mm -hmm. two really big uh, asset classes. Uh, the other 50% you would put in small cap value. That gives you access to small and that gives you access to value. With those two funds, you will get a portfolio that is more profitable than the 11 or the 10 fund strategy going back to 1970. And you will see uh, in our latest uh, YouTube that we've done on these portfolios that the risk is about the same. So yes, you can do it with two funds. We yet we don't we're not able to really get that pure balance that we want with one fund. Tom, you are a jewel. You're a dear friend, and and I, I really appreciate all that you do to educate investors. The world is changed by the work that you and Don do. Your daily your daily podcast that you. In fact, I think one comes out on Saturday and Sunday, if I'm not mistaken, as well. It's a week to week kind of thing on the weekends because we do five a week and we try to we try and add them in, but it's a lot of work. So well then I think you have a number where people can call and ask a question. Yep. Do you? I mean they, they can record the question yep. at that number. Yep. 855-935 talk, I believe it is. Okay. Only uh, 24 7, 855-935 T-A-L-K. And you don't want them to talk dirty or anything. I mean, you have. Oh no, I do want them. At my age, I do want them to talk <laughs> dirty. You're wrong there, very much so. So. Oh, you're great. All right. Well, Jim, I think we're going to give it back to you. We really appreciate Bainbridge Community Foundation, and 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 Tom is right. Christine Benz is a jewel. Absolutely. And I, I'm excited to see her presentation next week. So I hope you all will join us. Thanks, Tom, and. Uh, Pleasure. Hi to the family. Thank, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Paul. Um, Tom's email is there on the screen right now. Uh, Paul's email is paul at paulmerriman.com if you have any further questions. Um, and we do hope you'll join us next week where when um, Paul will be sitting down and talking with Christine Benz. And then the following week, I will be talking with Mary Beth Franklin. So thanks all for joining us and have a great night.